to an election, the new government, and the last three weeks was essentially all about what's your housing policy? What was in my circles online? So what I want to do today is have a good conversation. I'm going to essentially talk you through my big idea, which I call Housemate. It's uh, essentially copying Singapore's Housing Development Board, but in Australia, we only do conjoined words like job seeker, Medicare, um, home builder, housemate. So that's my big idea. And hopefully as we go, you will uh, understand why that's my big idea and why I'm not here saying, oh, let's get rid of negative gearing. Let's change capital gains tax. Let's do this. Let's do that. If you have questions about that, please raise your hand. I want to talk about all the uh, policy ideas that have been circulated in the last few weeks, the shared equity scheme, the social housing fund, the super fair housing, I want to talk about it all, but I want to use my big idea as a structure for that. So I really appreciate you all coming. Uh, if you've got your phone, go to fresheconomicthinking.substack.com and subscribe to my newsletter. Uh, it's mostly about property economics at the moment. Um, but I do have an updated version of the book on corruption coming out in August called Rigged. Uh, and you'll probably hear about that there as well. So I'm happy to answer some questions. I'll keep an eye out for your hands. But let me start by considering what the housing problem really is. Now, it might seem obvious to you that there's a housing crisis of some sort. My experience being a housing researcher now for a decade is that everybody has a little unique boutique version of what they think the housing crisis is. So we're all sort of pushing in different directions. So, for example, um, the right politics doesn't like the fact that the home ownership rate is falling. It's fallen from 71% in the late 60s to 65% in 2016 when we last had uh, the census. Um, so some people think that's a problem. Some people think it's private renting, that private renters aren't protected from price increases when they're not moving and they're, and they're stable in their home, so that it, it becomes insecure. Some people think, well, the public housing stock is declining as a proportion of the stock, so for the most needy, we're limiting their options and squeezing them into the private market where they have to compete with people with higher incomes. Maybe that's a problem. It goes on and on. Uh, first home buyer deposit gap. That's an issue that both sides of politics have decided that's their main focus, with Labor proposing the shared equity idea where the federal government will buy up to 30% of your house for you, and the LNP proposing using your super to cover that gap. Some people think it's just high prices in general. No particular reason, just high prices are bad. I find that puzzling because we don't talk about BHP share unaffordability or other assets, and I think it points to the idea that property is an asset, and that's going to be a key feature of uh, my idea and, and a lot of the discussion I expect on various housing policies. Uh, a lot of people think it's competition between investors and first home buyers, so it's, oh, it's negative gearing, so investors can pay more and outbid all these first home buyers. Well, yeah, true, but then homeowners, like first home buyers, have 0% capital gains tax. Right? So, you know, they've got an advantage as well. So, what's the outcome we want there? I've heard some people say there aren't enough investors in housing because investors disproportionately buy new and off the plan dwellings. If there aren't enough investors, private developers won't build because they're not selling. And so, there aren't enough homes. So, we need more investors. So, we should give them more tax breaks. So you can see everybody's got a sort of unique, different take on it. And I think my take after all of this um, back and forth and trying to puzzle through all these concerns is that the big problem in housing is the life cycle income problem. The big problem in housing is that young people to have secure housing need to buy a very, very expensive asset at the same time as their incomes are the lowest they'll ever be in their 20s and 30s. Their costs are the highest they'll ever be, because typically people start families in their 20s and 30s. Many are paying hex debts, many are paying rent, and they're trying to save a deposit all at the same time. And they're paying super. And then in your 40s and 50s, you're in your highest income earning years. Um, and you don't really, you know, the value of that secure housing is, is not as high anymore. You're, sort of, you're, you're over that hump. 
Um, so I find that's probably a good way to conceptualize the problem, and that leads me to the idea of copying Singapore. So let's see um, where we get to. So I've been puzzling about this for a long time, and the big question, everyone has their ideas. The big question is, can we look at a place and say they have solved the problem? Because we can look at, for example, negative gearing and capital gains tax rules, and we can just pick countries from anywhere in the world and go, hey, they've got capital gains tax rules, and they're having the same complaints we have. These guys have different negative gearing rules. They have the same complaints we do. Yeah. So once you start looking into it and saying, well, you know, does fixing that little thing get us to something good? Can we observe this happen in practice? You start getting a little bit disheartened because if you think about the last two years, rising prices and rising rents, you can go to any state in the United States, any country or city in Europe. You can go to Tokyo, one of the apparently the great you know, solutions to home ownership, according to, to some people who think planning is the problem. And everyone has the same problem right now. The only place that doesn't is Singapore. So the question is, well, what are they doing? <laughs> And why is it that if you look around the whole world, they're the only place you can look to and go, gee, they've solved pretty much all of those problems and the life cycle income problem, which is where I got to. If you compare Singapore with the sort of peer nation of Hong Kong, Singapore has 90% home ownership. It's cheap to buy. The dwellings are 60% bigger than your average dwelling in Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, it's 50% ownership. It's exp ex very expensive, and the dwellings are tiny. 15 square metres per person is one bedroom. Australia has something like 88 square metres per person of internal housing space. Right? Hong Kong has 15. Singapore's not too, doing too bad compared to its peers. So what's Singapore doing that's so different? Well, it's not negative gearing, it's not this, it's not stamp duty. They have a mass scale public housing developer that builds 20 to 40,000 brand new dwellings every year in mass scale projects. They sell it at a discounted regulated price to any citizen or permanent resident who doesn't have property, who doesn't own any property. They have three additional grants to those first home buyers based on income and one on family location. So uh, if you are within a kilometer of your elderly parents, you get an additional cash grant to go and buy that dwelling. Because the housing system in Singapore is integrated into the welfare system. Uh, previously, the Housing Development Board, which is the agency that runs this, had provided public mortgages from, from well, it's called the uh, Central Provident Fund, but essentially you can think of it as a public bank at a discounted price, reducing the cost of interest. And you can use your compulsory savings, your superannuation, for a deposit and to repay the loan. And after five years of mandatory occupation of that dwelling, you can trade it on the second-hand market to any other qualifying buyer, first-home buyer in that system. What has that done? It's taken home ownership from 20% in the mid-60s to 90% today. Your average 20-something Singapore couple when they go to HDB and apply for a home, they have no additional out-of-pocket expenses to purchase that home because their compulsory savings pays the lot. The majority of Singapore citizens in their 20s pay nothing to purchase a home. It's pretty radical. I've interviewed people in HDB. I've interviewed new couples who've just moved into there. Obviously, couldn't travel to Singapore in the last couple of years. And um, that's the expectation. When you've had this for half a century, you expect it's your right to get a bit of real estate. Just like when we show up at a public hospital, we just expect to get treated. Yeah. Can a foreigner buy this kind of property? No. So essentially what that means is that there is a parallel public home ownership system operating beside the private market in Singapore. Just like we have the public health system operates and the private health system and you can pay whatever you want for whatever treatment you want, 
if you go to the public system, you'll get served on a needs basis. Here, you get served on a needs basis, only first home buyers. Um, and essentially now, 90% of people live in dwellings built by HDBs in the mid-60s. Sorry, can just that last one? Yes. What does the inheritance give them? If your parents have an HDB dwelling and they die, you can inherit it. So what you're doing with this is just you're, you're solving a household's housing problem for many generations because that house gets passed down for the apartment. So, so what percentage of people in Singapore that get one of these homes would keep them throughout their life? Almost 100 percent Yeah. You can trade, so if you're in your 20s and you don't really have a high income and you want a cheap one, if you don't have any kids, you can buy it. You have to be a couple, there's a few, I'll, I'll talk about more of the details, but then five years later you can sell it. You can sell it, so when that young couple's coming, they go, oh, I'll buy the new one from HDB, or I can buy any of the second-hand ones that existing buyers are selling. Mm-hmm. Right? So it just, it just takes, takes first-home buyers, puts them in a separate market, and says you guys can deal here at a discounted price, and... And you won't bid up the price because you can always buy a, free, a new one at this cheap price. Yeah, how is the quality of them given their public housing? The quality of them? I'll give you an example. Who knows Aria, the housing developer, who's got uh, a whole bunch of buildings in South Brisbane with trees on the roof and terraces and everything? Okay. They sell super premium apartments in Brisbane. They told me that the whole company was flown to Singapore to have a look at the beautiful buildings that are being built in Singapore, and they've now written it as their company purpose to be as good as the Singapore Public Housing Agency. And they're they're one of the most premium uh, apartment developers in Brisbane. So these are very desirable. Um, However, they're very cheap. Here's the prices from last year. So when they say room, they mean room, not bedroom. So two room is like a bit of a studio, five rooms like a three bedroom apartment. Okay, so five rooms, usually 110 square metres. So if you are 22 years old, in a couple, on a relatively low income, you can show up at HDB and pay $29,000 out of your super and buy a brand new studio apartment in that subdivision and get a loan at a super discounted price. Yes. You've got a number of different towns here. Correct. Are those towns, are the, is the housing nicely distributed around the population? Or? So, obviously, Singapore is only like 70 square kilometers, right? It's essentially as big as a couple of big suburbs in Brisbane. Yes, the towns, there are premium areas, there are non premium areas. The new estates uh, that aren't well established are usually cheaper, and then redevelopments of premium areas are usually more expensive. Yeah. Do you have a question? Do you have one? Um, this, the, 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 these are long-term leases, aren't they? They're selling not really free. Good right? question. They're 99 units. Yeah. Okay. I can assure you that that is not an important factor. Mm. The ACT has 99 year leases. They were all started in 1911, and so a few of them are coming up for renewal. Do you think the ACT government is kicking people, people out of their homes and saying, you've been there 99 years, sorry, your lease is up, you've got to buy it back from us? They are not. They have decided, if we don't need the land for $260, you can roll over your right for another 99 years. In Singapore, the same thing is happening. When I spoke to HDB, they said it is not going. No one's going to have to purchase again after 99 years. And in fact, they have 59 shorter leases as well, but they're essentially just giving them to keep forever. And, it, you know... The point is, even if you had to repurchase, you'd end up just giving it back to them at a super discounted price. So what's, what are you gaining from that? Right? So I don't think that's um, a big practical issue. So what do these apartments look like? That's a three room. Everyone has a bomb shelter in their house. Um, everyone gets a kitchen, bedroom. Everyone has without external windows and all rooms. Uh, that's your five room, 110 square meters, two bathrooms. Like it looks like any other apartment you could buy in Brisbane. Um, and that's what you get dirt cheap. So, so, so how does the government afford? Uh, yeah, we'll get to the budget. The reason I propose this is because it's dirt cheap. And it's kind of counterintuitive, but you'll, you'll, you'll see. 
So I don't want to show you lots of pictures of these apartments, just go and Google it, because the point is not about the physical design of the building. You can have the same economic design and build whatever you like. So in Myanmar, the, the HDB is consulting to them to, to help build public housing. That's what their projects look like there. In Brunei, they have townhouses and detached houses in their pilot project that the Singapore Housing Development Board is consulting and helping with. Uh, and in India, they're doing, obviously, a lot of high density there. But in Australia, you would not everything would be high density. You could do blocks of land on the urban fringe. It would, it would be fine. You would do the distribution of property types that people actually like in different <coughs> cities, different towns. You'd have apartments in the inner suburbs, townhouses in the outer suburbs. So the question is, well, wow, Singapore looks really good. That's kind of what their system is. What should we copy? Which elements of their design are important? I'm kind of going to, I'm going to drop in a few things I haven't really mentioned. So I think the important ones are public supply controlled by queuing or quantity at the regulated price. What do I mean by that? Um, instead of, so the ACT has a public housing supplier. And they act just like Stockland or Lendlease and they have options and they, they get the biggest price. HDB sets the price and says, says if there's too many people, we will just build more and keep selling at that price. We'll use a lottery um, to deal with the backlog temporarily, but essentially um, we will just keep building at that price until we get through the backlog. Uh, you separate out the market for first home buyers from investors and upgraders and foreign buyers and everything else. So you, you, you break them apart a little bit like public health system, everyone who doesn't own property has the right to operate in this market. You use compulsory savings for deposit and repayment. In Singapore, it's actually 20% compulsory savings. Here it's only 10%, so um, it probably wouldn't cover all the costs here, but it would be a huge gain. And you allow secondary trades within the market. So basically what I'm saying is you don't get one for life when you're 22 years old. Uh, and when you're 50, you can't move, you can trade amongst other people in the same market. And the reason the price will stay low is because everyone in that market can go buy the new one at the cheap price. Right? So there's no reason to outbid for a second hand one. What doesn't matter? <coughs> Things I haven't mentioned. Social engineering. Uh, couples, uh, singles could not buy an HDB dwelling in Singapore until 10 years ago. Now you have to be, you know, as a single, you have to wait till you're age 35, whereas a couple is age 21. Um, there, there is a family location, the additional discount if you're near your parents, and the additional advantage you get, they now have what they, they call multi-generational dwellings, which are essentially apartments with additional quarters for your elderly parents, and if you apply for one of them, you get ahead in the lottery, so you don't, you know, usually it takes two or three years to get from application to the new, new apartment, but if you apply for one of them, you get quicker. They have racial quotas also in each development, so they have Indian, Chinese, Malay, all the rest. Essentially, they just mix everyone together, forcefully. No, I don't think that matters to the economic design of the thing. They have a particular political history that might warrant that. I don't think in Brisbane any of that is super important. So, sorry, please. Keep going. They're yep. socially mixing. Yes, force. They're forcing. Could be important. Could be. We'll have to see. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't see huge, huge issues currently. Um, but yeah, um, that's what they do there. It works for them. They accept it. It's obviously not unanimously um, supported. Right. Um, but that's what they do. Financing with the public bank. They don't do that anymore in Singapore. I'm proposing to do it because it's an easy way to make money. Because you just get your public bank, you lend at a cheap interest rate, and you make money to subsidise the system. Why don't you have a private bank make money from giving mortgages to this, these people? It seems bizarre in my view. So I propose just get the, get the uh, Reserve Bank to lend the money. At a cheap price. price. Anyway, physical shape doesn't really matter. Mix of Aussie preferred dwellings, as I said, in the 99 year lease, that was the question we had earlier. Non issue, they'll get rolled over. So it's essentially equal to the $3. All right. I'm um, slide for a while, so let me try and uh, <laughs> remember. So I've got two locations here. I've kind of got a um, cheap area. In the expensive area. Location A, expensive, you've got a housemate, you've got the equivalent private purchase. So up the top row, the price, 550 versus 750. Okay, it seems like a reasonable discount. 
you can do low deposits, so you only need 27,000. Okay, so your loan is um, still a lot smaller. You can do a discounted interest rate at 2%, why not? The cash rate's only 0.35, you're still making the margin. The important uh, point to note here is when we get down to this first yellow line. So this is an example household with $90,000 income, so they're paying um, about 8500 or 9000 super. When you get down to it, the cost of purchasing here after super is 18000 per year. So that's 18000 after tax, after super dollars to purchase this dwelling, whereas the equivalent place right next door would cost $43,000 after super, after tax income that you would have to pay. Yes? How many years? There's no small like the loan, uh, I think one of the things is, is as of 25. It probably says somewhere up here, 25. But of course, because it's so cheap, most people in Singapore pay this off in 10 years. Um, people just dump their money in. The super's already paid for it. It's, um, it's 25 years low comparison. In a cheap area that has the same discount, fixed discount on the private purchase price, so it's $150 instead of $350. Everyone in the inner city keeps going on. That's so cheap, but if you look around Australia, it's heaps of houses for $350,000, and people in those areas should have the right to live in a place for cheap, just like anyone in the city. Um, and in that case, that negative $1,800 pretty much says your super will pay for this. You'll, your super will cover everything. You, you, you will have the experience of the average Singapore citizen where you get a house for free. Yeah? Isn't the risk of using your super in that situation is you're not going to get much capital gain, so your super is basically going to be stalled, isn't it? Well, you do get some capital gain, but that's a good question about super because I'm very anti-super, and maybe we can dig into that a bit more later. But essentially, owning a house is the best asset to have in retirement. You can get a bucket load of capital gains on Tesla shares or whatever you're speculating on. If you don't have a house, you will end up poor in retirement. That is the best thing to own. And so essentially the way Singapore does it is says, owning a house is the best asset for people, so we will let them use their super to buy a house first. This will be the first asset your super fund purchases, and then after 10 or 15 years, then your fund can buy other assets. But this is important to own first. So that's how I think of it. Um, so, sorry, research proves, does it, that, that a house is the best? 100%. Thing. 100%. The reason why is because uh, it's shielded from the asset test of retention. So, yeah, so owning a house is the best thing to do uh, in retirement. Uh, for example, the ACT decided um, they wanted to get retirees to downsize and make their homes available for young families, and so they gave them a stamp duty discount. They thought that's the way we'll you know, get efficient use of our housing. And the retirees went and bought bigger houses because they could put an extra 500000 into their house and then sit on the age pension and have a $2 million house for their kids, right? So that's sort of um, the logic. Anyway, so how can it be so cheap? Let's talk about the costs. The important thing to realise is the budgetary costs and the economic costs are completely different concepts. The budget is just a made-up document of we put in numbers based on random rules that we've evolved over time. And I know that's a really cynical way to put it, but it's just make-believe. The economic cost is like the true cost. Sorry, are you talking about the federal budget? Correct. The government budgets, government budgets. They're political documents, right? Um, they're tricks. So don't think about, oh, we don't want big numbers on the budget. Nobody cares. If you really think about budgets for a while, politicians only talk about the budget when they don't want to do something. When they do, they don't talk about it. It's just, you know, it's just a political trick. So let's not talk about the budget too much. Let's talk about the economic cost. And the economic cost is what we call the opportunity cost. And of course, any time a public agency builds a house, it could sell it at the market price, right? If it wanted, it doesn't have to sell subsidised housing. We can have a public agency you know, compete with Stockman and Lindley scenario and build houses and sell it at the market price. So any gap that you have is going to be what the subsidy is economically. Okay? But it doesn't have to be recorded as a budgetary cost. And I'll, I'll talk about that. So 
there's many ways to sort of overcome the political constraint of the budget. You can forego margins on development, right? Typically, a private property developer wants 30%. You've immediately saved 30% by not paying them their profits and just building it yourself on average. And of course, you're going to be a big developer with a diverse range of projects in lots of cities. You know, the risk is no big deal. So you're already there for a lot of things. You can supply public mortgages and take the interest rate margin and subsidize the system. You can acquire land below market prices, and I can talk through an example uh, in a minute. You can cross-subsidize. You can sell some of them to the private market to the international investors, just like any other developer. And, you know, floors 1, 5, and 10 can be sold to the private market and the rest can be these people, these first people. And a sort of a bigger cost, but do you know what I mean? Like over six people will pay... They will pay the market price. Yeah. And these guys, out with yeah. the first home buyers who qualify, will pay $200,000 less. So if you sell three floors, eight... You know, 24, you get an extra 24 times $200,000 subsidy of the others. So I think, you know, it's not that tricky. Um, and, I, and I think this is ambitious. So Singapore produces 20 to 30,000 lately. They've actually wound back because everyone has a house. They've been doing this for 50 years. So they're, they're past the peak of construction. Um, they, the budgetary cost is $2 billion, essentially. There. Um, the other point that's worth noting is that the benefits to this system last indefinitely. When we compare, for example, with the budget cost of the National Rental Affordability Scheme, rental subsidies to the private market, $2 billion a year, it's $2 billion for one year of benefit. This year is $2 billion for 20,000 people for 99 years or more of cheap housing, you only got to subsidise once, right? So um, it's super cheap. It's historically, Singapore could acquire them with low market compensation. The key lever is getting sites into the system. Now, a lot of people have said to me, oh, yeah, but there's no land. You can't just, capital city's got no land. You can't just build public housing wherever you want. Really? We came up with 70 hectares for a casino, magically in the middle of the CBD, with absolutely no public debate. We came up with seven hectares down on the river here for a very, very important project, which is to put the international press in there for two weeks in 2020, 2032. So they have a nice new building to store their video cameras and do their telecasts. And I'm talking about the Olympic site, the, the, the glass factory and whatnot down along the river at West End. We paid $165 million today to, to acquire a site and build a building to use for two weeks in 2032. We acquired the, the racetrack at Albion. $39 million we're paying to racing to build them a new racetrack somewhere else at Ipswich to get a whole bunch of, I think it's, uh, it's more than 10 hectares there of inner city land. So when we want to acquire land for stuff, we do it. In New South Wales, they've compulsorily acquired 500 properties for their West Connex metro thing. There's absolutely no issue finding locations. And in fact, the, the example at West End is, is really interesting because um, if you run the numbers on 165 million, you get 5,000 dwellings there. If you Devote a quarter of it to other uses, so you're actually paying 120, 100, 120 million for 5,000 dwellings. You're actually only at $50,000 per dwelling. Land cost. 50,000. Every apartment sells for a million bucks. Not that, not that much. But yeah, it's, it's almost nothing, right? In the grand scheme of things. And where you go, oh, how do I get land? You know, it's going to be so expensive. The worst case scenario, buying inner city land in a capital city on the river, $50,000 per dwelling. Worst case scenario. So I think it's totally easy. Totally easy. Um, we can do it. We just prefer to have Olympic venues, casinos, and tunnels. That's just the preference we have politically. And no one asked about the budget for that. No one said that casino, how are you going to pay for that? Where is it in the budget? Which is good. That's good. We like, we like casinos. 
Yeah, we could have sold it all at market price, but we didn't. We just cut the deal. We think that we'll get some casinos and um, gambling taxes. It's fine. Anyway, use of super. Singapore solves the super housing problem. Uh, yeah. So the problem of using super for any housing, and we can maybe talk about the coalition's proposal, is that if you've got a backlog of first-time buyers who now have an extra $50,000 each, they're all going to want to buy at the same time in the market, right? So they'll all end up at the same options and they'll start bidding up price. That's what I'm saying is adding financial firepower and bidding up prices. Now, that doesn't happen in the HDB, that's the Singapore Housing Development Board, because the price is fixed. If there's a wave of first home buy, your, your number, so you want a three-bedroom apartment in this new complex, you just apply like a pre-sale and a private developer, and if there's too many, they put your little ball in the lottery and they wind it, and then when all the three bedrooms are gone, they uh, they build it. And if you missed out on the lottery, you get two balls when the next the next time you're applying. Okay? So it's really fair. They developed some good systems. The point being, when there's too many people in the lottery, they don't have an option and you bid up the price against each other. Yeah, they'll go, oh, we better build another project soon because we've got two twice as many applicants. And I think that the average there is. Um, I think two to four times they try and keep it only only twice as many applicants per project. If it blows out to four, then they accelerate their other projects. So um, it usually takes three years from from getting approved to apply to moving in. Sometimes it's been a bit longer during COVID. Uh, many options to get land in development sites. I've just ranted about that for a while. So uh, there's plenty of Crown Council federal lands. You could ask private developers to tender projects. There are approvals at Garrett Bill, but um, uh, at Calandra South, there are massive, massive projects already going on that have tens of thousands of approvals. You go and ask them and say, hey, can you uh, provide us 500 sites in this project for a housemate at a discount? This will de-risk your project. You'll get 500 families moving in. It will add value to the later stages. If you can match this price, then, you know, we'll pay for it now. Solved. You don't have to wait around for trying to sell it at the market price. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, yeah, we've never had problems finding Olympic sites. How are we going? Sorry, man. Pretty good. Physical locations. Uh, you want to meet the market demand just like the private market does. You want larger apartment complexes and mixed-use suburbs in the inner city. You want in suburbia, townhouse complex, mixed use communities, and the outer suburbs, you can have detached houses. You can just give people free blocks of land if you want. Um, and just like, yeah, just like private developers, you would need to monitor. So if you have a new project um, that has big blocks of land uh, at Logan and it's you know, got five times the number of applicants as plots, and you go, geez, people really like lots of blocks of land because our inner city apartments and they've got twice as many applicants as, as um, apartments. And so we're going to shift our mix into more of these things. Yeah. Um, there's this kind of technical point there on the pricing. The pricing's kind of, um, how do I describe it? Probably the most simple way to imagine it is that pricing in Singapore has traditionally been based on construction costs. So essentially you pay construction costs, you get free space, free land. And I think that's not too bad, but one of the problems is you want the relative price between different locations to be matching the slope of the relative price of the market, or everyone will just pile into one location, because it seems like it's a much bigger freebie compared to private market option. Um, but you can deal with that. Um, as I said, Singapore manages the queuing, um, so they know what's worth more and what's worth less. Yeah, how do you design a public institution to start doing this? Uh, an interesting story, I did some research in the ACT six years ago, and, and when I realized they had a public um, land developer, a suburban land agency that built and subdivided all the new housing lots in the ACT, I asked the um, staff of the chief minister, uh, because they were talking about having this land rent scheme to offer cheap houses to first home buyers, and it was this big set up and I, I said to them, you realise you can sell these new lots at any price you want to anyone, why don't you just sell them at the cheap price that you think you want? No one is 
keeping the price up except you, because you, you own all the new lots of land. If you want people to be able to buy them for 300000 sell it to them for 300000 And they said, oh, yeah, well, we wouldn't want to do that because we'd flood the market and bring everyone's house prices down. So, so that's the sort of political reality at play. Um, you could do something like this and just flood the private market, right? But I think partitioning it off into this public parallel market like Singapore is super important. The question, therefore, is how to get uh, an institution, a public institution, who's, who wants to build lots of houses quickly and get people in them. Uh, we have a lot of relatively, uh, um, relatively good state public housing agencies, but their hands are tied. In New South Wales, for example, they won't give the agency any money. They, to, to build a new house, they have to sell some land they already own, get that money, and go and buy some new land and build houses elsewhere with that. Now, if I was a private developer and you said, sorry, you can't use debt, everything you own is all you've got, okay? if you want to build a new house, you have to sell some land, they're not going to do very well. And yet that's the rule of New South Wales. So if you constrain them, tie their hands, we need to think about uh, managing you know, how much money do you get, how do you have incentives for efficiency, how do you have incentives so that the queues come down and you balance things out. Um, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, performance pay, um, design competitions, uh, you know, we should be experimenting with this to see what works. You just need some hard heads in there who just want to get on and do it, right? But you don't want them, you don't want them sort of tricked into making lots of money, you want them tricked into building as many dwellings as they can, the best design. One of the interesting parts in Singapore is that um, they focus on reducing the ongoing maintenance costs. So your typical apartment tower, brand new in Brisbane, what do you pay to for the body corporate to run the building each year per apartment? Seven to ten thousand per year. So you're already at one hundred fifty to two hundred dollars a week just to pay for common areas. What do you think your average HDB apartment cleaning costs? Hundred dollars a month, twenty-five bucks a week. Way, way less. Way, way less. Now, admittedly, your fancy apartments have more pools and more fancy barbecue areas, whereas there are, there are efficiencies in Singapore because you don't get an apartment block pool; you get a suburb, like a public pool, in your area. Right, so. You don't get your personal gym, you kind of have a gym in the suburb. A little bit like uh, West Village, if you guys have been there in West End, they have a gym. But they don't have an apartment gym, they have a gym in the complex. So it's a bit more, um, there's a lot of efficiencies there also. Um, so, who gets them? Citizens or permanent residents. My proposal for Australia is 24 as a couple, 20 years a single. We're going to come up with a play with two couples, two single people who have a property each get together, you force them to sell, do they quarter their key products. You come up with something, uh, you can't own another residential property. One of the issues in practice is if you ramp this project up, you're going to start with one project. That'll be the first one. And you will have three million Australians qualifying. <laughs> right? So you're going to have a few issues allocating that. So perhaps you have local residency requirements. So First project in this council area, you have to prove you've been a resident of that council area for three years, then you can apply for that one. That also forces the agency to start looking in lots more areas, right? So, you know, to take the pressure off. You might want to focus on key workers. I know a lot of, um, you know, hospitals and schools in Sydney, especially, it's like, well, no one's going to work here because they have to commute two hours because yeah. we're paying them, we're not paying them enough to live anywhere near their work. So maybe a state government wants to um, pilot the scheme, prioritizing them as, as we ramp up. Um, and as, as I said, we've, uh, there's a petition in the ACT to trial the system, um, but any, so you'll need some kind of requirement as you trial. You can't just let any Australian citizen or permanent resident who doesn't own property apply. Um, you could, you just end up with a really big lottery. Um, yeah, that's kind of what I explained earlier. Okay, so this is one difference in... Yeah, just a question. Yes. Um, so what is the current home ownership percentage in Australia? And 65%. 65. And so how many, you know, if you can build 
20 to 30 grand in a year. Yeah. Well, great question. How big is this going to be? What's the demand? Yeah. So how many, you know, if you could do everything to that, how many millions of... Hours? That's the next slide. Okay. You're, you're, you're following everything, huh? <laughs> you're hitting it. Yes. Good questions. How many people would there be? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think that's... How big would the scheme get? Yes. There you go. So, um, trading second-hand homes. So, Let's just say we're a few years into this, we've got 100,000 dwellings, I want to move to a bigger one, I can see a new project being built. Um, I've got a small apartment, but I want to move out to the suburbs, they're doing detached housing now. I'm going to sell my apartment. Um, uh, in Singapore, you have to sell to an HDB qualified buyer. I was putting it out there, I'm not, I'm not really sold on it. You could sell to anybody. Now. The same thing in Singapore, everything, every apartment's almost the same. When I say the same, there are no detached houses and townhouses in this system. They're all in big buildings, and they're all similar sized apartments. You're going to end up with a lot of houses out in the suburbs, detached lots, where people have gone uh, very Dale Kerrigan. You know Dale from uh, The Castle? The film? And they've got, you know, dog kennels and all the rest, and they've dug a hole, and they're just like, well... Do we want them to have to sell to an eligible buyer and housemate, or can they just sell to anyone who likes this quirky stuff? And I thought, well, I mean, the house is already there, so what's going to live in it? Is it important? And I thought, well, maybe you just let people sell to anyone but pay a fee to sort of remove their dwelling out of the system. And so that's my idea. But you obviously can't buy back in the system. Now, I've not don't need to do that. It's just my idea. It's, it's a pitch to make it seem more home ownership y, um, to sort of bind that Australian dream to my house. It's my, it's my nest egg. It's, it's, you know. But, um, you know, partly I just want to give people houses and I don't, you know, it's not a design element I'm um, stuck on. So, your excellent question how big could we get? So, a good rule of thumb in Australia is 10 million dwellings, 10 million households. 65% owner-occupied, 30% rental. I think it's more like 31% rental, 4% public housing. Uh, even within a decade or two, uh, all these homes would still be owned by some private owner, and they would still exist, right? All these 9.5 million homes would still exist, and someone would be living in them. So we're not going to take the existing stock and shift it into the system. We're going to grow this little alternative option. Um, there, as a good rule of thumb, there's 100,000 first home buyers per year, and there's about three to 4,000 house, housing transactions and sales. So first home buyers are usually a quarter of all, all trades in the market. Potentially we could get 30 to 50% of them, so that could be 800,000 1.4 million dwellings in 20 years, so that could be 6 to 10% of the project if you project the housing stock out and it all grows. So in 20 years, we might have 65% private ownership, 10% uh, public ownership, which is what the system is. It's like a public home ownership system. 20% private rental and 5% um, public rentals. Now, it doesn't seem like a huge amount, but uh, typically you would have younger people living in this. So you'd almost have three people per household on this. So you're looking at sort of three to four and a half million people. So it would be pretty substantial. Not quite as big as um, Singapore's system currently is, which is, um, yeah, nearly 5 million dollars. Um, but what's the beauty of getting to this point? The beauty of getting to that point and having the system in place is that everybody who ends up buying a private dwelling who's a first home buyer still has the option for this, to go to this scheme. So what does that do? Well, it reduces your willingness to pay for private housing because you've got this cheap alternative, right? So it's going to take indirectly heat out of the private market. Rentals, everyone's getting squeezed on rentals. Jesus, oh, because I can't buy a house, I can't do anything, I, I, my income's too high for public housing, there's a big waiting list. I'm squeezed, I have to pay what you want. Here, uh, I'm squeezed, but within two years, uh, I can get in this public housing scheme, right? So having the additional option, the choice, is itself a good thing. You don't have to have 90% of people living in a public home ownership dwelling, 10% are 
we give everybody uh, at those crucial times in their life the choice and the option to find a cheap alternative. So, well, we're there. So that's my rant, and I really want to keep um, discussing some housing ideas. So, yes. Um, yeah, what happened to the private market in Singapore over time? It's just nuts. <laughs> Still. So, so uh, <clears throat> one of the couples I, I interviewed said they paid 300000 for their apartment. They moved in a few months ago, and they said um, a second-hand one in the neighbourhood would be about 500000 So you do pay a premium for the second-hand trade. So people do make money on this. Yeah. People make money, but not that much money. And do you know what? Everyone's like, well, yeah, that's fair, because we all get to do it. It's not unfair that I make money out of housing, because everyone can do it. Like, we don't get upset when people in the private market make money out of housing. We're like, oh, aren't they great investors? They're so savvy. So in Singapore, this is like, well, we all get to do it, to a moderate degree. Um, so their place was 300000 that was brand new, 500000 second-hand one, um, a million bucks, you said, for a comfortable condo that if you're a foreigner, you would have, that would be your option in their neighborhood. Yep. I'm really interested in the numbers of how much it costs the HDB to build a unit versus how much they sell it for. Mm-hmm. Yep. Like, like all, up, all the subsidies and everything. Uh, the actual cons- well, the I can tell you the actual construction cost is only about uh, six, uh, the total all-in cost on average is about sixty thousand. So it's one Singapore dollar is basically one Australian dollar, conveniently. Um, so essentially, it's about fifty to sixty thousand dollars. They sell it for fifty to sixty thousand dollars less than the all-in development cost. So is there just not enough private developers to create competition? Because if they're able to make a unit for 250000 yeah. and sell it for a million, yeah. surely there's a massive incentive for people to make units. Uh, that's a good question, and that's basically what I do research on this day. Um, not exactly, because... Um, if you own a piece of land that can be redeveloped for two hundred fifty thousand dollars per unit and sell for a million, you already own the asset. You don't have to build to have that value on your balance sheet because you can sell at any time to someone who will, and they'll pay you the difference. So it's you've got to think about property development not as a uh, as a cash flow sort of business where I need cash flow. You've got to think of it as a financial business where I'm, I'm trading an undeveloped asset. It's already worth the sale price minus the construction costs. So why would I build? So you need a kind of different incentive to bring that construction out. Um, but then, like, because it's true everywhere that houses cost less than the cost to build. Like that's the land value. If that wasn't true, land could be free everywhere. So um, it's just saying it's highly valuable. Sorry. So your construction cost of um, two hundred. What was it? Two hundred. About two fifty to three hundred. Yeah. 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 So is that not including land cost? No. Okay. And you said land cost was fifty to sixty thousand. Okay. I mean, it still seems like a massive profit if you develop a unit, right? But that's but uh, yeah, it's true everywhere, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that's it's but, true everywhere that if you build a house on a piece of land, mm. the house and the land is worth more than what you pay, right? Um, if you read my sub stack, you'll see a lot of writing on that very topic. Um, did you have a quick hand up just before? Mm-hmm. Right behind you? No? Okay, there's two guys here. Go over here and then here. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so my understanding in Singapore is that you've got the public housing competing with private sector housing. My other understanding of Singapore is that space is very, very limited. Does that mean that? the government is potentially making it more difficult for the private sector to be accessing the land needed to develop and compete with the public sector. I don't know. Um, I think it's important. Uh, it's a similar question to the guy behind, right? Mm-hmm. Like, if you're, you've got a private site, why wouldn't you compete with these guys, right? Um, 
But that's that's kind of another topic in general of why do house prices go up? Because construction costs don't, right? And the question is, what well, everyone could just keep building at the same price. Like I think it's a it's a bigger question. I think my view these days is that it, property markets are not competitive. I mean, property is the word we use for monopoly for centuries because we know that property owners aren't in the business of competing with each other. Right? Because property is free, right? It's just a piece of paper. It's a line in a database that says you own this piece of space and no one else can go on it and we'll bring the police if they do. All the property already existed, right? So the question is, well, why is property worth more than zero? We come along. So in the 1850s in Queensland, we had these land sales. They surveyed all of Brisbane, and they had auctions, and they said, who's going to buy this piece of land? They wrote it down. There's property. It's like, heaps, costs heaps. And the question is, well, why, is it, why isn't it free? It didn't cost you anything. Right? Why is property free is a sort of bigger question, but please try and read my substack. It's like two weeks ago. It says, why aren't land titles free? <laughs> Sorry, you had a question there. Um, how do you start becoming like issues in terms of crime? Like, looks at, look at like America and you know, the UK as well. They've had sort of large scale public um, mm -hmm. housing and it's ended up as projects and sort uh -huh. of slums and low. Uh -huh. It's ended up as a like, basic crime hubs. Uh -huh. um, how do you go about make sure that doesn't happen? Yeah. So that, that'll be the fear. If you, oh, yeah. public housing even in Australia has a reputation for being problems, you may start making towels, then the, the political yeah. will to keep doing that if it all turns. Yeah, I, I, well, great question. Um, there's a few things. Don't build crappy buildings. Build really good ones. I mean, Singapore's are better than the average brand new million dollar Brisbane apartment. Right? So don't build crappy one. Two, let everyone get one. Like the public health system. No one goes, oh, the public health system's crap. If I'm in a car accident, take me to the bloody Royal Brisbane Emergency Police. It's got the best emergency. Uh, thirdly, we're very good at public housing. This is just all political storytelling because we have two great public housing dwellings for the Prime Minister at Kirribilli uh, and at uh, the Lodge. Says our crime. Pardon? See, yeah, well, maybe that makes your point. Maybe I'll fall down. Um, but we spent $11 million for a part time public housing uh, house for the Prime Minister who clearly didn't need uh, public housing. And so I think if you if you think more broadly, I mean the, the defence force all gets historically public housing to no complaints, right? Um, well, so have, you, have, you, have you looked at DHA? I have spoken to DH defence housing recently. It's a very different model these days, but um, it's very much oh we'll get private investors to buy this and we'll guarantee their rent. I'm like, why are you making private investors money from owning the houses that you? Are essentially taking all the risk on. That's another bizarre thing. And I think, um, you know, just on that point, I find it really baffling talking about traditional public housing that um, the government, not the government, just people generally, see it as a great big cost. And it's interesting because. Um, when you come to sell public housing, people are willing to pay you a lot of money for it. So the question is, well, why are you calling it a cost when it's an asset? So if we look at the Land and Housing Corporation in New South Wales, their portfolio went up in value from $32 billion to $54 billion between 2012 and 2019. That is like a great 7.8% compounding. That's a massive return. You could sell that and people would pay you a fortune to own the public housing stock. And the government's here going, oh, we can't afford it. I'm like, it's worth, it's an asset, it's worth lots of money. If you can't afford that, you can't afford anything. Um, so we're thinking again about housing as the cost versus housing the asset. Just sort of came up, sorry, it's not directly related to question. We had one in the corner. Oh, not so much a question, um, but just a comment. Um, maybe because of the word public housing, it mm -hmm. has certain connotations mm -hmm. in Australia, and that example of, you know, the towers or whatever. And, um, I, I grew up in Singapore, and so when we when when we call public housing mm -hmm. is really housing for the majority of the population. Yeah. It's not for a, a socially depressed, uh, un, unemployed, you know, yeah. sector of the community. 
the housing development board is housing for all citizens yeah. and that's the way it, it, it sort of operates I suppose so just that idea of um, you know preventing it from turning into slums or you know all of those that, that other factors really contribute to that yeah. um, employment or, you know all of those other factors so it's not about the housing that, that yeah. creates the, 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 the problems with slums uh, these are so well designed that there's you know public transport there's you know all these other factors yeah so you're basically making the point the whole middle class lives in this 90% yeah, I mean, of people do and to buy one, you have to be employed because you have to pay, pay buy the flight usually with your super, right? Yeah. Um, there are social housing dwellings managed by HDB. So if you've never had enough income, they'll just put you in an apartment and they will charge you something like $80 a month. It's like a token thing that's put you there. I, I, had, I, I spoke at a group um, late last year and... Uh, before I put this idea on paper, and I said, we know we can solve housing because Singapore's a real place that exists. And if we're not doing that, are we really interested in solving housing? And a lady in the crowd came up to me at lunch, and she said, oh, funny you mentioned Singapore. I'm from Singapore. Uh, I'm a social worker, uh, and I came here to help homeless people because we don't really have homeless people in Singapore. Mm -hmm. And I'm just shocked that you just won't give people who don't have homes homes. <laughs> like, totally different mindset, right? And I'm just like, yeah, it's like not that hard. You're homeless, sorry, you can't have a place to live, break your leg, I'll put you up in hospital. I'm like, well, that was nice, but why didn't you just give them somewhere to like, live? Like, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, challenges. Homelessness is not just so I don't have somewhere to live. Um, but you can certainly start. It's not exactly expensive. Um, we keep, we keep saying, oh, houses are expensive. To buy, they're expensive, and then they last you a long, long time, right? And so someone being put up for a while is only a tiny fraction of the time that you get to use that house. I think you had a question, did you, as well? Down here? Yeah. Yeah, the ideas you've presented make a, make a lot of sense. I, I think, but I wonder whether in Australia we have the political will or environment to actually implement that. The, the, the thing is, I think, for example, simply put, a lot of our decision makers they own property yeah. portfolios, so they, want to, they don't want to see the values of those portfolios go down because of the scheme they implement, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah. let's face it, our country is run by the rich, for the rich, as far as I'm concerned, and so as long as that's the case, I think... I'm totally with you, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, I feel like you're like really speaking straight out of my thoughts here. Um, well, even look, I, I am a homeowner. And, and I bought a house for a certain amount. And say, for example, somebody bought a house for, say, something like 500,000. And then you put a, a scheme like that in place, and suddenly you can get the same house for 300,000. Yeah. Okay, you have to wait until yeah. it sells off. But like you said already, in the Singapore case, that actually leads to a much uh, sort of less active private market, That's and the, the, the prices don't go up as much as they would if you have a, have a completely unregulated market. So. Would you then be willing politically to make the, the idea more palatable to compensate existing homes and say, well, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. we, we reassess yeah. the value of your home and we compensate yeah. you for your loss? That, then, you know, uh, maybe existing homes would be more willing to say, yeah, go ahead with it, you know. For people that have bought more mm. recently. Yeah. Well, for anyone. Can you just get an evaluation? What's so, the market value? Just, you can implement the scheme and you compensate. I'm a home owner too, and the amounts of it are. Yeah, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but this is a great point. You basically, I, have you been reading my Substack? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, no, I've been thinking about this. Oh well, then obviously people life. who think carefully get to the same conclusions. Great minds. Um, that's very good. So I, I did a speech uh, for the UQ Politics and Economics Society earlier this year, and that was my point. Is that um, I don't really recall the numbers off the top of my head, but. Um, if you look at the, the financial disclosures of federal MPs and senators, you can add up who's got how many residential properties, and then you can apply the average um, price in all the different areas. And I think I added up, if you add up the, the councils, so there's four to 5,000 councils around Australia, um, state politicians, I think there's 1,400 state politicians and um, nearly 300 federal politicians. If you add them all up, uh, they own over $13 billion of residential property. And the question is, well, 
how do you get four or five thousand people in a room to conspire to pass a rule that's going to wipe billions from the value of the balance sheets? Now that's impossible, right? So, um, so that is part of the pitch for this. Although I just finished by saying how great is it that the people who have this option aren't going to bid as much for this. My political pitches don't say that part. <laughs> my political pitches say, I'm not here to intervene, interfere with the housing market. I'm not here to crash the value of your home. I'm here to offer young people an alternative. They can still buy your house at whatever price you negotiate, but I'm here to offer an alternative. I'm going to let the private market operate as it does. Now, you know, most thoughtful people go, yeah, but wouldn't there be an indirect effect because people would just go there? And I'm like, well, yeah, but shh, that's the whole point. We're trying to escape this political constraint where we're never going to tax property more or do anything that has huge effects. So yeah, um, the value of residential property in Australia is 10 trillion. So that's 10 million million. Uh, it's quite a lot. And if we did something that did wipe the asset value down 20%, that's two trillion, like it's two trillion is as big as a whole share market. Uh, we just wiped that to zero um, overnight. Uh, so yes, it is a big barrier. I'm trying to pitch this as a this way to slightly sidestep because I'm not just going, oh, and I'm going to make the price cheaper and that's going to affect your house. I'm going to go, oh, I'm going to leave you guys alone and just do this other thing over here. Um, yeah, sorry, keep going, yeah. I was just quick. I mean, another point, like, like the, the, the solution that I see um, is, for example, now we have so much plotting going on, you know, like, uh, and talk about, uh, you know, buying back this that land and stuff, you know. I would think it couldn't be used that land, for example, for tiny homes, you know, uh, to give, because if you know, if plotting occurs, the tiny homes could be, you know, be uh, um, towed away to yeah. uh, high grounds temporarily or something like that. All I'm saying is that but if there are solutions that actually would increase supply, and our politicians seem to be mostly only the only mm. think of, of how to increase or to help people buy stuff yeah. by giving them all sorts of grants, you know, yeah. which only result in prices going up further. Mm. Good point. Tiny homes, I'm like, might as well build people a big home. Like, as long as you get enough warning yeah on the front. otherwise so, <laughs> so just on that you know a lot of people go I have tiny homes have smaller homes I'm like that's not the solution that's like going oh uh, we, we can um, have more pizza by cutting smaller slices I'm like no just build them like we're the richest one of the richest countries at the richest point in human history ever if anyone has ever solved this problem before in human history we can do it now may as well be people Build people better, bigger homes. Um, someone had a question up here. Yeah, yeah. So just just back on the impact of the private market. So my first question was sort of leading to this. So what I saw in Singapore is there's first of all very high percentage of units. So yeah, apartments. So the public housing is competing directly with a large part of the private market as well. And then what I saw from my brief time there, so it may not be accurate, but um, the housing market was the one that was totally under strain because it's not competing with the housing, with the public housing. So there is kind of a parallel market there. So you have, yeah. you have a, a typical house in Singapore and there's not many of them, it's like 10, 20 million, right? So it's insane. But yeah, the, the privately sold apartments were, were much lower proportionately. Than to so, housing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Oh, that's so just... I'm wondering whether you think Australia is quite structurally different in a sense in how our housing market is structured because if we're primarily going to be building units maybe townhouses but we have a large kind of stock of houses yeah 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 would correct would this not affect the housing market as much do you think or maybe good question i don't know uh i think you would do still a lot of houses detached so off the top of my head off the top of my head 62% of <coughs> dwellings in Sydney are detached, uh, detached, 38% are attached, and that's the biggest percentage in any area. Um, so I think an Australian public housing provider would still probably get 40 to 50% of detached housing. Because once you're out of the capital cities and you know, premium areas like the Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast, etc., once you're out of there, it's detached housing. Um, there, there will be. It, it's true everywhere when cities develop that the house, the, the big blocks of land that 
the houses that stay become relatively more expensive than the apartments that are nearby, like New Farm, Tenerife here in Western and South Brisbane. So that's that's sort of always true. Um, yeah, I, there are going to be some price effects. I'm not worried about them. I, I see it as a benefit. We just all have to keep quiet. <laughs> Labor um, said they're going to fix affordable housing. housing so, is this going to be pitched to government? Oh, yeah, I've been pitching it to everyone. Yeah, yeah, they don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Why? 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 They, uh, well, okay, I'll just tell you. So, uh, I spoke to Doug Cameron. Remember him? He's a retired Labor guy, Scottish guy, uh, the lefty of left Labor. About five years ago, oh, yeah. and I said to him, he's like, "Oh, what are we going to do about getting more housing supply?" I said, do you, "Have you built any houses? Like, you know, when there's a shortage of submarines, do you just go, oh, please build submarines? We'll give you a tax break.' No, you just go and you pay someone who builds them to build them for you." And he goes, "Yeah, but governments don't do stuff anymore. Governments don't build things. We can't do that." It's the leftiest left guy in the Labor Party. <laughs> Who said no? We can't. We can't do it. We just don't do it. We don't, and we can't. You haven't got the right pitch. And then I said, this, "So I, I thought he was my lefty mate, right?" You know. Anyway, <laughs> he'd been around politics a long time, and I think he was just saving my um, breath by just telling me how it is. I think he'd personally like to do it. But he's just saying yes. By that, did he mean that the government wouldn't build them themselves? Well, no one's. You know, it's not going to be a public servant. It's going to be Hutchinson's and everybody else. You're just going to acquire the sites, pay the architect, and then tender for the construction. Like just like privatization is construction. Like any other developer, any other developer doesn't build. They pay a construction company, right? But they own the property and they manage the process. <laughs> um, I spoke to Andrew Lee, who's a an MP from the ACT. Labor is a former economics professor. He didn't like it because it costs too much money, and he thinks the housing market is fine. When was that? That was about three weeks ago. Oh. <laughs> it was just before they announced stuff. Um, and he also said, "Super for housing, you will just be shut down left, right, by the Labor Party." Which, fine, that's their thing. Um, but let me. Maybe, do they have more questions now? Because I just want to... Yeah, just a quick question here. So in your scheme, or Singapore's scheme, do you have to have a certain income level to qualify for these loans? And uh, do the interest rates go up with the market rates? Wow. And what, what happens when you fail to pay the mortgage? So, what was the... Your income and the interest rates. Yeah. Okay, and so... What about you do for? Yeah, so that's the funny thing. You basically have to stay there and rent it fucking cheap, right? Like, um, so, first question was income. So, you do need a minimum income to qualify for the cheapest. Now, if you're below that income, you qualify for a cheap rent, like $20 to $50 a week. Um, once you have that income, there are income, two income contingent subsidies that you get if you buy new and one additional family subsidy. And so I do not have it in the slides, but there is a table that literally says annual household income, total subsidy. Wow. Um, yeah. And it goes down. So I think it starts about 80,000 at the bottom end and it goes down to zero once you're about 20% above the average income or 30% above the average income. So it essentially pushes everyone into these. It's like everybody gets one. Right? Um, the interest rate, it's capped at, so it used to be, uh, it used to be the overnight cash rate was 1.5%, and now it's capped at the average of a sample of private bank mortgages or whatever, right? Um, so now you can go get a private, you can go to Commonwealth Bank and get an HDB mortgage, but they have, they have to charge less than a particular amount of interest rate. Um, so there's like three questions in the back row, yeah? Um, just on the income side of things, does that mean if you're unemployed, you don't qualify? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So you have to have a job, and then if you become unemployed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get there's a uh, what do they call it? Um, oh god, there's a word. If you become unemployed and you default, the, the, I'm not exactly sure how it works when you live there. 
but it's quite interesting because you would already you'd automatically then qualify for discounted rental in the same building. <laughs> so um, I'll just have to double check. Correct. You stop paying it off, yeah. and then you start yeah. paying rent temporarily, just a nominal amount. But I have to double check. I don't think you get kicked out um, if you lose your job. Mm. Um, there are there are arrangements that I've read about where you transition into different schemes. So you're in the normal scheme, and then you're in the low income scheme, and then you're in the rental scheme. And if you lose your job, you transition into schemes and pay different amounts for different things. Yep. Um, Cameron, just concerning receptability for that scheme, which you mentioned earlier on, getting into becoming acceptable. Yep. Uh, I come from a generation when baby boomers followed me and two or three other generations, and we, during that course of time, naturally have had a huge increase in the home and mm -hmm. other second homes and property. Now, a lot of people I know uh, then, in turn, aid and assist their young mm -hmm. people when they're ready by loans, and, you, you know, it, yeah. I, I don't know if there's been any research on this, but there's had to be around between 8 and 10 million property owners who aren't all avaricious or necessarily so, especially when it comes to the time to have yeah. their kids when they want to get into a house. That's true. And they, they do it at the moment. So what I'm thinking of is, is there a way of integrating that sentiment, that public sentiment? Yeah to assist mm. the leg up into this scheme, yeah. which is a sort of a backdoor entry. You, you bypass the political systems and all the complexities mm. by appealing to public sentiment. I, I, so, I'm uh, sure the figures in millions of, of bank mum and dad. Who would, yes, it's good. It's who can't possibly reach, say, if you look at the renovation business at the moment, it's booming. Yeah. And you go into uh, ordinary people's homes and they spend Twenty-five, fifty thousand dollars. They've already been told they can have a hundred thousand based on the increase yeah. of equity in the home. Yeah. Now that's usually at a time with the teenagers. Yeah. They get to twenty-one, and they get to twenty-two. That cost in renovation no longer has the same value yeah. in the time frame. Whereas the priority now would be for any excess money, because it's a recognition that you get the money for nothing, or you get the increase in your wealth for nothing at the at their expense. Yeah, I like your, I like your pitch there that everyone else is getting an increased property value for nothing. How about everybody has a chance of getting some some wealth for nothing? I've also like your pitch is a lot of the people do feel like they need to help the younger generation. So this is sort of saying, well, every if you don't have the bank of mum and dad, we're here for you. Everyone gets in your way. Um, yeah, uh, I'll think about that. Thanks. Um, sorry, there's one more in the back. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was just thinking that's probably one major step before any of this, and that would be establishing this uh, government uh, anti corruption commission. Yeah, well, we there's might get one now. Opportunities in here. We might get one now, yeah. so let's just see. I think that would be useful. Um, you had a question, we'll go back to Was there any, like, it sounds like such a good scheme, did they struggle with having a population explosion of people who would go there? Maybe. You have to be a citizen or permanent resident, so it does take a, long, a while to get there. There are a lot of people in Singapore who don't apply, like foreign workers, and they're squeezed into some private dwellings, mm -hmm. as they are in Hong Kong or anywhere else in a wealthy Southeast Asian country. Um, so no, I mean, they haven't had the popul population explosion we have. I think it's 5.7 million people in Singapore. Um, anyway, the, the scheme started though, interestingly enough, and this is maybe a good political um, thought starter, is um, there were some major fires, I believe, in the 60s where whole blocks burnt down, and so there were 20,000 homeless people in one night, and uh, to, to have a legitimate you know, government, you've got to be seen to be doing something about this. So they started this mass rebuilding program. Of course, once you've done it for one slum area, yeah, exactly. you've got to keep doing it for everyone else. Yeah. And they'll just start a fire. Yeah. <laughs> so it took a crisis, is my point. Not that we should burn the houses down, but it took a crisis. <laughs> and the government was sort of pressured into doing something radical. And then everyone's like, hey, actually, it's pretty good. Just keep going. But I think it has started before the fire. Yeah, so the government has started building and encouraging people to move into these apartments. But there was a lot of public resistance, and then it was the fire yeah, that changed public sentiment and incentivized people to move. It's always a crisis. 
I'm um, just saying if you do it in, in one pilot project, there can be unintended consequences of that. I've seen, like I've been involved in um, doing development work in squatter settlement settlements mm -hmm. and getting together as well and get all excited mm -hmm. and do wonderful things and transform one area and then everyone from other surrounding squatter settlements moving to it and different things. Yeah. You created new problems. Well, yeah. fair point. Sorry, you had one? Okay. Yeah, I okay, was just wondering, um, do you think that if the Australian Greens housing policies were implemented from today and rolled out over the next 20 years, that the mix of dwelling types in Australia would be similar to yeah. what you would expect here? Uh, I think that basically got the broad idea right, is get out there and build houses. I don't... I haven't read what their specific view is on how to allocate them to people below market price, right? Um, you can use it for traditional public housing for people who qualify in those uh, for those, or you can do it some some other alternative for allocating to people. They they want to build a million dwellings in 10, 20 years or something. So the way I see it is, once they get started, they will sort of converge towards something like this once they're building at scale. And if they don't, they they'll you know still be a million extra houses for the people who live for cheap. So I think it's great. Um, this is just where you kind of get to when you look around the world and go, what's been working well for a long time? Um, you done? No, one more there, and then we'll go back up the back. I was wondering uh, how much resistance one would have to expect from the banking sector for a scheme like that. Oh, yeah, the banking. Okay. Uh, I, so I wrote up a report. The main, just the main concern, as far as I can see, for, for banks is like, for example, you get a loan of $900,000 for a $1 million loan, and then suddenly you find Across the board, that the whole of before you know, lives of all those properties half, or maybe yeah. only two thirds. I, I think you know they wouldn't be very happy with that. Yeah. It could actually affect the stock market. It could have a, a domino effect, you know, across. It's going to it's going to be very slow. Like mm. it's going to take a while to to, to ramp up. Um, yeah, banks will hate it. Private housing developers will hate it. Everyone who's rich and powerful will hate it. Yeah. We had a question at the front Sorry. here, Ari. Yeah. Did you? Have, yeah. yeah. No, I was just, uh, when you mentioned um, it, um, um, a disaster bring out the system yeah. in Singapore. Yeah. Hong Kong, we had similar disaster because ah. um, we had a lot of a slum yeah. um, back in 70s or 60s. Yeah. And then there were fire obviously yeah. because of the um, density in the area. And um, they built a lot of seven stories um, building. Yeah. So it's very interesting. Most of them would be like at the ground level would be a school, primary school. And then on top, there would be a lot of um, house um, units for poor people. Normally, it's like the, uh, what do you call that, uh, the lower class. Yeah. Um, and then they develop, gradually develop into, um, what is like, you pay the rent. And I think um, back in maybe 2000, they mm -hmm. had this scheme. If you stay in the unit for a certain time, okay. you can have the ownership of that. Units, but it wasn't popular. I don't know why. And then they have another scheme, which is like more like private. It's in between the private mm. and the public. So it's not like you know the lower class. It's more like middle class. Um, but then the government just reduced the effort to do that um, because Hong Kong, you know, before that, even though we have so-called democracy, and actually we had democracy, I think, <laughs> and. Um, but basically, there wasn't like election. Yeah. Government had a hundred percent power um, to do what they wanted to do, and so. But stamp duty was the main revenue. Yeah. So that's why they didn't really bother to to um, contribute too much to build the houses uh -huh. for the poor. Yeah. Um, they'd like to turn over in the private market. In the yeah, so only like a small portion, so they are not competing mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the private um, developers. Um, but it's getting worse and worse because I think we still have the um, people from mainland China every day. It's like non stop. Yeah. And the mm -hmm. is very small. Um, yeah. yeah, talk about, you no, know, we don't have enough land here compared yeah. to Hong Kong and Singapore. I don't know whether they know what they were talking about. Yeah. Like when they say they don't have enough land. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, that's what's oh. kind of my point. You see, Paul, because you're. Uh, sorry, you want to just add a, something? Just, just a quick question. I know in Singapore it's very much structured around the concept of 
housing family unit. Uh -huh. so family unit is a, is a traditional heterosexual uh -huh. couple, uh -huh. or maybe family unit, like, uh, you know, mum and, and children, grandma and uh -huh. grandchildren, or something like uh -huh. that. Um, how do you think this would translate in Australia, where a fair proportion of um, individuals uh, look who are well, facing housing stress uh -huh. uh, would actually not fit into those neat, yeah. you know, family units. That there's the singles, you know, who are looking for housing, yeah. who are employed and you know not wanting um, what's traditionally called public housing yeah, in yeah. Australia. Yeah, but who so. are, have aspirational housing. I, I would just let anyone, I would let anyone apply. Um, it's really tricky, right? Because we get so used to just um, deciding that, well, market prices are fair, that's how we allocate things if you can pay the price. But when we try and do something to avoid the market price, we actually have to think about all these things of, well, okay, we've got a couple with kids or a single guy, or there's a certain number of things, dwellings we can build in a year, are we going to prioritise one or the other, or do they just get one ball in the lottery? Because one has a one has um, four people in their household, and one has one. Um, so it, it is really tricky, and I think uh, we'd have to come up with local local rules. I don't want to exclude anyone. I just want to give everyone their house for cheap. <laughs> like I just think it's really interesting when when the, uh, there's a there's a book I stumbled across recently talking about the history of Medicare, and it's really quite amazing that we have the same debate as the Americans have about health insurance and you can't just do public hospital, we can't have socialised medicine. We had all those debates for 20 years. And now that we've experienced having a good public health service, we're like, well, why wouldn't you do it? And I think we'll get to the same point with housing. Oh, we'll worry about, oh, the public socialised housing, you know, the ghettos, all these things. And then you'll find, like in Singapore, when you do it, well, everyone just wants to have it, and it becomes so much better relative to the alternative. So I feel like that's um, sort of how it can go at a broad level. Do you, yeah, go. Okay. Yeah. Um, you're saying the government don't like to build themselves, and you want to avoid that ghetto situation. Why don't the government do like all the apartment towers that are being built and saying you've got permission to build this? If you allocate 15, 20 percent of it to public housing, social yeah. housing for every every building that's built, so every so scheme that's built. So they actually do that in the city already. Yeah, yeah, because they were doing that in Ireland. That's how they got slums as well. Yeah, one yeah. percent. The UK does that as well. Yeah, yeah Ireland yeah. does it as well. Yeah, uh, let's just. I think it's called inclusionary zoning. It's pretty common. Councils try it all around the country. Uh, one problem, uh, there's, there's a lot of margins where you can sort of fudge the numbers to avoid any obligations. So, for example, I think there's a council in Sydney, you have to have a, a project over project over 20 or 30 dwellings, and then you have to give one to the public housing. Just do it for everything. If it's over, like, four dwellings, yeah. 25% bump, and that's... Well, everyone just does their projects in stages of 19 dwellings, then, right? Um, so they never have to give one. There's a bunch of loopholes, right? Um, so you can do that. You can do that. I think my view has evolved to that's one way to do it, but I think people, you can get more support from that really powerful property development industry if you don't tell them what to do and if you instead pay them for their product. Um, because then they can, they can't go, oh, are you making your house expensive? All these onerous regulations. You can go, I've hey, got the same regulations before. I'm actually paying you to manage this project for me and build more houses. Stop complaining. So um, I think it works. It can work. It's usually the implementation is really tricky because this is argument that's about every single thing. Did you really approve this or was it previously approved in this legacy um, document? Or will I wait till this requirement expires when I lobby to get a new councillor in next year? So it's, it's really tricky. Um, yep. So, uh, Cameron, would you... Um, Envisage a pilot scheme, and if you did, um, <coughs> what sort of banking and finance would you envisage? A pilot scheme. A pilot scheme for yeah. your introduction. Yeah. As a model. Yeah. Uh, uh, recently in the news, you might have seen that probably everybody heard about this uh, um, safe 
group of houses that uh, an anonymous donor put in six million to produce this these wonderful row of townhouses. They're yeah. already built and done. It's almost as if it happened without anybody. The, the, the donor has remained anonymous. Uh, what I'm saying is that could be an example of philanthropy or of some form of private. Uh, if it has the, what, what's your feeling and opinion yeah. about it, or how would you get it off the ground? And you just you just write an act of, to create the organisation, and then the treasury will pay their bills. And you don't, I don't think financing is a big deal. We pay. Oh, well, you mean from the government? Yeah, yeah, yeah. but that's conditional. You want to, you want to pile the well, yeah. Um, uh, so, for example, for example, uh, Orange Council called me and said, "Oh, all their workers are leaving because all the all the wealthy." inner city people came out here during COVID and rented all the fancy places and bid up all the prices and now all of our businesses can't hire anyone we've got a block of land and we want to build houses for people what should we do? I said go to the Commonwealth Bank, get a construction loan, build houses and give them to the people you want oh it can't be that, that easy I'm like well why not Like, I could do it I could go if I own that piece of land to the Commonwealth Bank and borrow money and get a construction loan. And so, you know, it's so I feel like, um, you know, we don't, we're, we're tied up when it's expensive or it's difficult. It's not. People build houses all the time. You just got to get um, someone who wants to do this to do it and have a have a, an understanding of well, how you're going to put people in those houses. And I think that's actually the more difficult part, not, you know, lending money. To, councils to build houses. The difficult part is, oh, 500 people want to live in my 20 townhouses. Who do I pick and what do I charge? Like, that is really tricky because you can undermine your credibility straight away. Whereas the beauty of this scheme is it's such a broad scheme that no one's excluded. The only con con controversial part is, well, you're using a lot of really hurry up. Um, so, yeah, I think that's tricky. Yep. How did the HDB acquire the land they built their houses on? Uh, now just, they're just compulsorily acquired, just yeah, like any other. Yeah. Previously, they could compulsorily acquire but didn't have to compensate at market prices. They could do below market deals. Um, they also voluntarily buy land. Mm. Yep. Mm. Yeah, yeah, just think about that farm. Those the ice limbs in all three years. I'm a bit familiar with this. Right. Um, and how much of this is directed more by the strategic economics of this that they actually want to have? To foreign investors and the, and the international economy, but they have a low cost, uh, you know, uh, lower cost of living in Singapore. The, the, the cost of doing business there is much lower. Is it not? And they, have, yeah. they don't have to, you know, they have employees that spend a lot of money on housing. Uh, good point. Uh, like, that's a great pitch that that's what you if you house people cheap, mm -hmm. um, then you can be more internationally competitive because you solve one of the internal. Um, distribution of the cost of what we do here, that'd be a robust bucket. But no, they've still got advanced manufacturing, they've got financial services, they yeah. have international conferences, they have quite a wealthy economy. It's a reason I'm it, but, look, uh, but look, I think your question books probably explain why. <laughs> it's still the case. Uh, yeah, so it's really tricky, right, when 65% of people own their own home. Singapore started this with 20 or 30% home ownership. Um, lots of informal ownership. The well, ownership's not really the issue. If you want to, um, well, you get the uh, you want to have your workforce that can actually. Well, uh, on that issue, yeah, yeah. Does anyone want to talk about the um, the announced housing policy announcements? The the uh, social housing fund that Labor announced ten billion dollars into a fund social. Public housing. No one's heard of that. I didn't actually hear about that one. I heard about that <laughs> you heard about the shared equity one? Um, and the super 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 that one. Uh, what's the time? Uh, we should wrap up. Yeah, we should have no, yeah, 15, 20 minutes. Um, <clears throat> social housing fund. Totally weird thing. Do you, so essentially, they just said if we get in government, we will get $10 billion and we'll go and buy uh, shares and bonds and stuff, put in a fund, and, and the interest on that. And return on that we'll use to build social housing each year. Anyone think that's weird? It's, a, it's, uh, <coughs> it's market forces at, at work in order to achieve the end of the problem. Where did they get the 10 billion from? Yeah. If you need a fund to pay for the housing, 
why don't you need a fund to pay for the fund? And you just have $10 billion lying around? <laughs> so what they want to do is say, instead of buying property assets and yeah. building them, we're going to buy BHP and Tesla right. and Apple and treasury bonds. We think that is a better thing to do with $10 billion. Yeah. I'm like, well, hang on a minute. You're going to buy Stockland. Stockland owns apartment buildings or Mervac has built to rent housing. You're telling me your solution to buy housing is to buy companies that own housing instead of just building housing yourself and owning those houses. Where, where does this make sense? Well, so just buy it. Like they could give the money to yeah. the Land and Housing Corporation that made twenty billion dollars, by the way, twice as much as they're putting aside in seven years in property values. They could give it to them. I mean, what is that but a social housing fund? Is it just that the governments have got so big into privatizing everything they're scared yeah. of doing? It's just it's just thoughtless nonsense, basically. They're just like, um, this sounds good. People who charge us fees on ten billion dollars will be happy. Or the so it's really more like an extension of the future fund. I mean, the future funds work, so I think they want the same thing. Yeah, the future for funds silly too. Social, so <laughs> like, if you want something, you pay for it. If you don't want something, you buy something else. You don't need the fund. And then we can talk about super later. But so that was that. Social housing fund. Shared equity scheme. Also very interesting because it points to this same idea, right? So Labor says, I'm going to give, I'm going to buy a 30% equity stake in your house and I'm going to not charge you rent on it. Right? That's what it is. They'll buy 30% of your house. You live there. You borrow the money, buy 70%. And when you sell, they get a share of proportion of the capital gains if you ever sell. Or you can buy them out at a value value and price in the future. What they're doing is they're buying housing equity in houses that they're getting zero rent for. Right? Why can't they just buy 100% equity in houses and build houses and not charge people rent? It's identical. Identical to just going and buying houses and saying, you can live here for free. There's a difference. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, when someone is contributing to the payment of their house, you've housed someone who is taking responsibility for that ownership. That's the difference. And if you've only got a bucket of money, you yeah. can house a lot more people if you're only paying for church. Yeah, no, no. Fine. So, management, we've got a management issue. That's fine. I mean, people live in private rentals all the time. You can, you can also pay for the maintenance costs if you want. You're charging zero rent and you're buying 30% of a house. Right? Yeah, and what you're doing is you're essentially saying, well, you can manage it for me, the other owner. The point being, economically, you're just buying houses. <laughs> Why don't you just build houses? Right? This is something else I see in the data here. Look what happens if you assume no population growth. You've added 1.4 million homes to put people out of rental into public homes. Huh? What's happened to the rental homes that they had? Sorry, this this has all the growth. Let, let's assume that those percentages are acting at the same rate of growth as population growth. Right? So we're talking percentages. You're talking about adding a lot of homes uh, in the public sector. Yeah, correct. And taking people out of rental homes. Correct. You're affecting the market supply. Correct. Yep. Is there a supply issue at the moment? Because your real goal here is to get people into homes they own. It's not to fix well, home supply, it's right? It's to get them into homes they own much, much cheaper. And early. Yes. Do you have so, to control the supply to do that? Uh, yeah, no. no, no. <laughs> okay, so I often use this uh, thought exercise. Everybody who lives in a home, one day we write a law that says if you live in a home, you own a home. If you have a mortgage, you do not know, owe a mortgage anymore. Same number of people, same number of houses. Have we solved the housing problem? Everybody lives in the home they currently live in, no one's paying any rent and no one has a mortgage. Have we solved it? Yeah. I think so. That, what does that say to me? That says the quantity of physical dwellings is not an issue. It's the distribution, who owns them and who doesn't own them, and what the people who own them 
uh, are willing to sell for and what the people who don't own them are willing to pay for. Them. And but that's that the sort of trick here. A big consequence, though, because I mean, we, 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 in the housing market, there's a huge amount of private investment right, in the housing market. People own houses to own them, but they also own them to uh-huh. rent them to, uh-huh. um, and so there's a there's a consequence of doing that, uh-huh. and so you have to think about the economic. Oh yeah, there's a consequence. It will be the biggest distribution ever <laughs> right. of wealth. And, and that's, that's, where, the, that's where the backlash comes yeah, from. Of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. My other point of thinking about this is to say it's not about housing. It's mm. about getting, if people who don't own homes, mm. access to homes without having pay, pe- to pay people who do own those homes, whatever the market price is. What about self-funded retirees, though, who have not invested in super houses? Mm. And they're the ones who are funding their Yep. What, what about well, them? You, you mean if I just gave their tenants their house? No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, if, you, if this scheme took off and oh, what you just they get slightly sort less... of gorge that they could live on, it changes the housing market so their rental prices fall, you know? I think it would be very slow and more of everyone oh, time. Yeah. Like, um, I mean, markets crash all the time. Uh, oh, the super system went down 20% 2089. Yeah, house prices... You know, it went down 30% across the whole United States in two years. This would be a relatively minor effect over a very long time. So then, How is there an overall economic advantage for the entire economy if you get people to own their houses sooner at a cheaper rate mm-hmm. than if they have to wait 10 years and then own it? Like, how does that benefit the entire economy? Yeah, I don't know. Good question. Or does it? <laughs> Well, I mean, rent is just a transfer, right? It's basically saying young people must pay old people mm-hmm. to live. And this is just saying, well, let's just give them another option. Um, I don't know. Your point is kind of a macroeconomic point, is that On more that. people paying less yeah, money. We know that there's the social costs, uh, uh, and what, then the, the social welfare, they're more productive. Yeah. Um, less stress. But I mean, I don't think less we need to push something that's good on its economic Merits. Like, I don't think the public the health system is stable. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to go, well, public health care is good because it... You know, but how do you get by and if you can't prove that there's an overall advantage to the entire economy long-term, we're doing this? Well, yeah, this lady has a comment here. Don't, don't, don't talk about... Oh, yeah. Um, like, on that? Yeah. Like, oh, really? Yeah. You lost your yeah. train. Yeah. 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 Um, Can we let this lady yeah, speak, please? They started this um, a housing program quite similar. I'm actually trying to see the difference between... Where is this, Brazil sorry? Brazil. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. yeah like, I'm going to get some information, like, very, yeah, yeah. very similar. I think the only biggest mistake they have made it was doing, like, cheap housing, which they should have done. Like, cheap construction, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, not... Not terrible, not great. So it was something between, like, it didn't became like, like plum. I did have trusted a lot of people with like really low economics. So, but uh, uh, the biggest boom in economy ever. Mm-hmm. Because what it happened was, okay, we have a, like a huge demand. They had like, oh, we just people, we don't have house, we need to build the house. Biggest boom on the construction sector, like, ever. Yeah. Because you don't build it just the house. The house doesn't like it's not just like a box. When you're building a house, the option of place, you have to bring in all the infrastructure, you have to connect yeah. that house to everything else. Civil sector, housing sector, like what's the biggest boom in economy in life? I cannot I don't know the number. It jumps the economy to the fifth. Like like it, Brazil was the fifth biggest economy. Yeah. Because of something quite similar, but like the, like the construction sector just like exploded, and it, the construction sector having that much inflow of money, employment went up, yeah. distribution of wealth of people being I'm... able to pay for more things, have more That's jobs right. because construction sector is going to be supporting mm-hmm. all like a lot of of. of so the construction sector is pretty big, by the way. So it employs six to eight percent of people. It's nearly ten percent of GDP. So, for example, when COVID started and everyone locked down, we thought this is going to 
the huge panic, I said, well, isn't this great? Um, instead of just giving businesses free money, especially in the construction sector, why don't you go and negotiate bulk purchases of off-the-plan apartments and houses at a discounted price from developers who think they're not going to be able to sell a house now for another year or two? Mm -hmm. Go and buy hundreds and thousands of them. And what you'll do is you'll just keep that project churning on, everyone employed in that same project. So you can use it counter-cyclically to balance the economy because when the market inevitably crashes again, that 8% of GDP on construction is going to be down to 4%, right? Or it's going to contract really radically. Whereas you can then take that opportunity to go, hey, I'm going to start building during this slump. So I think, yeah, um, yeah it's a good point. So <coughs> Cameron, in regard to the... Uh, Index for HDI, human development, so on, mm -hmm. wellness, confidence. Obviously, this is about equality for mm -hmm. quite a large proportion of the population, which of course means that that equality leads to more cohesion in society. Is there any research in Singapore in relation to that aspect? No? There probably is. I, I haven't read it. But yeah, no doubt. Um, Maybe we have time for a couple yeah, more questions. Anyone who has an answer question, yeah, yeah, no, anyone yeah, wants to? Just only in terms of the compromise. I, I just, uh, I, I, as I said, I like the ideas, but I think you just go a little bit too far in the sense that you you need a lot of political uh, resistance. Right. You know, so in terms of compromise, wouldn't it be an option to um, let the public sector just build much more? Uh, but not dictate prices. Yeah. You know, then you create basically an oversupply that uh, that yeah. will then automatically yeah. Put, yeah. Put, put pressure, downward pressure. On price. Right. I'm totally fine with that too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, if you wanted to create a public housing developer to just sell yeah. lots and lots of houses cheap right. and uh, undermine the stop building, just start. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's Bob Catter's idea, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, well, he's always like. Uh, Government should just go and flood the market at the price they think it should be worth. Yeah. One last question. I'm fine with that yep. too. Yeah, last one. Um, yeah, I just wonder if there's maybe a hidden discussion about values going on here on the surface. Oh, yeah. So, is, is housing a core need like the Medicare health system, or is it a uh -huh. speculative yeah. asset playground? And I think mm -hmm. Australians have become used to thinking of it as the speculative asset playground, and then you enter it, start getting into a free market debate. Um, you know, I know the market, yeah. the free market is the answer to everything. But um, what we have seen is is um, asset prices of this kind of core need massively diverge by hundreds of percent over time from our wages. Yeah. Um, and so that is, ultimately that's not sustainable. So you have to confront it somehow. Very good point. Let's, let's wrap up there. Yes, housing as an asset is, is a huge issue. It's, it's also the case that the main transmission mechanism of monetary policy, when we drop the interest rate, we do it to keep house prices up or make them go up. And when we hope when house prices go up, people get trades in because they've borrowed the equity to renovate or they buy, buy a boat. And that's how we that's how we manage the macro economy. That's why the world's booming right now. Um, and everybody's having the same discussion we are having. Even in Singapore, they've um, increased stamp duty. Uh, it's zero on your first dwelling, if you're in two dwellings, it's 17% on your second dwelling. And it's like 32% on your third dwelling right now. They're saying we, our housing market is not going to become speculative. Our housing market is for locals to live in and own one house each. Um, that's kind of the message I get. And, and there's a real tension there. Um, we've got to think about how to manage the macro economy without managing house prices. Um, we've got to sort of accept that the issue is not really that there aren't enough houses, but we've got sort of a two-class society. Everyone who owns property and everyone who doesn't and has to pay them to live somewhere. Like, isn't it bizarre that you just you can't live unless you pay someone else? <laughs> like, you can't even put your body somewhere on the planet to sleep unless you pay someone. <laughs> like, surely we can at least grant people that. Um, here's a house for life, you can live here. I mean, I, I would even be comfortable just giving people these homes for life. You get it for your life, when you pass away, it goes back in the system and give it to someone else. That would be fine too. Um, so I, I'm not wedded to any particular detail. I think you guys have thought about pretty much everything that I've thought about as a group. We've kind of 
done the last few years of my thinking all together, which was kind of cool. Uh, and I'm not wedded to any particular element of this, but I hope you agree by now that some kind of like public option, Medicare for housing alternative is going to be hugely effective uh, and potentially sidestep that political debate of where taking a hammer to the private housing market to fix it, while we're going to leave the private housing market and create alternatives. So I really appreciate your thoughts, everyone. Thank you.